I don't know what it is about Liwa and having its most historically important lore be tucked away in limited yearly events, but here we are. First Moon Chase and now this year's Lantern Rite. Both focused on the ancient gods of Liwa, the friends of Rex Lapis, and the original Gwaley Assembly. Seems pretty important to me. Why isn't it permanent? I'll never know. Now, normally, I'd like to take this opportunity to expound upon the lengthy lore of ancient Liwa, but honestly, this event was mostly about Guizhong, and I've already made a beginner's guide to Liwa, and I know it's a little out of date by now, but if all you need is a gentle introduction, it should get the job done. So instead of reiterating everything that's already in that video, I'd like to not exactly analyze Guizhong, but just kind of let the thoughts flow, explore some possibilities, and to do that, we should really start by familiarizing ourselves with our primary person of interest, Guizhong. Guizhong, known by the demon name Hagentis, was the goddess of dust who co-ruled Liwe alongside Zhongli in ancient times. Originally, Guizhong and Zhongli had different territories, so to speak, but Guizhong proposed an alliance, her brains and his brawn working together to build a strong and resilient nation. The two gods, along with their Adepti companions, came together and formed what is called the Guili Assembly north of Mount Tianhung and modern Liwe Harbor in the Guili Plains. Guizhong thought of humans as weak creatures in need of protection and guidance especially. It's suggested that she wasn't particularly strong herself, because that's what Zhongli was for, but she had a lot of knowledge to share from her infamous Four Commandments to her love of machinery, which included Conrian machinery, which means Conria was around in ancient times, but that's a separate discussion. She was known for keeping very dangerous machines within her domain at the bottom of Luhua Pool. This area does seem to kind of be like her personal region. Guizhong's interest in machinery likely extended to alchemy, although there's no explicit mention of this in-game. I'm making this assumption because her demon name, Hagentis, is a twist on the demon name Hagenti. This demon was known for feats like turning all metals into gold or water into wine, which is a pretty basic alchemy type of thing to do. They were also known for teaching all manners of subjects, so long as it would help men become wise. It seems pretty fitting for Guizhong. But in all her tinkering and messing around and studying of machinery, she found time to invent things. And we know of two of her inventions currently. The first is the Guizhong Ballista, and the second is the Cleansing Bell. The Guizhong Ballista is a ballista made by Guizhong, so it's a good name, I guess. But Guizhong's reasons for making this ballista isn't entirely clear. Perhaps she wanted to compensate for her own lack of combat prowess by creating automated defensive weaponry. Whatever the reason, it was a blessing since the ballista would later be used by the Liwe Qixing as the basis for Liwei's defense systems against enemies like Osail. Now, Guizhong and Cloud Retainer were both mechanically inclined and often quarreled over their inventions. The latter once called upon Zhang Li to judge their prototypes and pick the best one. It seems like an odd thing to do since Guizhong had basically built a weapon while Cloud Retainer had built what appears to be a loom. It's just difficult to understand how the two could be compared fairly. I'm skeptical, but Cloud Retainer believed Zhang Li to be fair and impartial, and she eventually conceded that Gui Zhang's invention was superior after his judgment. I think he was probably a little bit biased here, though, as someone brash and in charge of defending the Guili Assembly would be far more inclined to favor a weapon than a cloth wielding device. But who knows? It seems like Zhang Li was asked to resolve disputes of all kinds, even intellectual ones, as it appears to have happened on multiple occasions. One such incident that involved Zhang Li's mediation involved the cleansing bell. This bell was not only capable of playing simple melodies, but composing them too. It's kind of like simple music generation AI. Streetward Rambler, who I will call Ping, hated this bell because she believed music to be something that comes from the heart and not something that a machine should make. It's AI versus artist, thousands of years before all those open AI fiascos. Who'd have thunk? Guizhong appears to have been particularly fond of music, though, because not only did she create the music AI bell, but she was also heavily associated with glaze lilies, flowers that only bloom at night, or at the sound of pleasing music. Zhang Li and Guizhong first met in a field of glaze lilies, and the flowers have since always been associated with her. Did she make them, or simply discover them and take a liking to them? It's unclear, but it's undeniable that the flowers are well suited to her aesthetics. They even match the white and blue cross patterns on her dress, although the flowers possess one additional petal. 
but this flower has some odd similarities to another flower that we can find in Sumeru, the Nilopalo lotus. This lotus and this lily have the same dark blue outer petals, the white inner petals in two layers with the same blue spurs and bright gold center, and both flowers only bloom at night. The Nilopala lotuses are flowers I've talked a lot about on this channel because of their connections to both Seelies and the Moon Sisters. Sources like the Moon Piercer Spear claim that when the three sisters descended upon the desert periodically, Nilopala lotuses would bloom at their feet, and when the goddess of flowers arrived in the desert, night blue lotuses also bloomed at her feet much similar to the Moon Sisters. From these lotuses came the race of the Jinn, who are closely related to the Seelie since the goddess of flowers was said to be a Seelie herself. Seelies are closely related to music and the moons and the stars and all things celestial, so does that mean that the similarities between these two night-blooming flowers suggest that Guizhong could be a Seelie? Honestly, the idea that Guizhong is a Seelie has been around for a long time, and you know, if she isn't a Seelie, then people have been theorizing that she must have been an illuminated beast, an adeptus much like Zhongli. Now, in my opinion, Guizhong is… probably both. See, I made this one theory a long time ago about the omnipresent god statue in Inazuma, which led me down this long and winding road towards this battle pass symbol, which I then managed to link to the Staff of Homa, which then linked to the Huma or Homa bird, which turns out is basically like a variant of the Phoenix. And this Homa symbol has a lot of ties to Celestia, which I won't cover in this video, but I will leave a link in my last attempt at this analysis in the description box if you're interested. So basically, the TLDR of the argument was that since the Homa birds have celestial ties, it is not a stretch to say that Seelies have bird relations, which would make sense if we think of Seelies as a type of angel, right? Angels have wings, after all, or at least most of them do. Do they have wings in Genshin? I don't really know, but what I do know is that the primordial one, who is supposed to be the god of gods in Genshin, had both wings and a crown, so it's not a stretch to suggest that Seelies, who would be related to them and the Moon Sisters and Celestia in general and anything in the heavens, would be represented symbolically by a pair of wings. And those wings happen to be shaped like the Homa symbol, which is obviously based on the Homa bird, which is like a phoenix. And in Chinese mythology, the pairing of a dragon with a phoenix is an ancient one, and also extremely common. In some dynasties, the phoenix represented the empress of China, while the dragon represented the emperor. Now, since Zhongli is a dragon, it would only make sense if Guizhong was a phoenix. Or the Homa bird, whichever. Noble clans in Liwei also seem to use the symbol of the phoenix. Xingzhou comes from a prestigious merchant family and has a coat embroidered with a bunch of phoenixes, while Keqing, who holds a high rank in the Qixing, has a phoenix feathers all over her dress. And there's also some gilded phoenixes adorning the roofs of some pretty prominent buildings in Liwei Harbor. Now, there's no real reason for all of this phoenix imagery to exist so prominently in Liwa if there was never an important phoenix to base the association on, you know? Consider, too, that Guizhong was the goddess of dust, which could be stretched to mean ashes, you know, since phoenixes go through cycles of death and rebirth where they are born through their own ashes. Ashes can be a type of dust. And if you really want to stretch the phrase, taking a quick look at her dress reveals a peculiar star pattern, which has, up to this point, only been found on extremely sus characters like Paimon, Danesliff, the Sustainer, and to a much lesser extent, Scaramouche and Raiden, who are not organic beings and were created by a god. But consider, could the god of dust be considered the god of stardust? Think about it. We're all made of stardust, and so is our planet. From the stardust of the planet we are born, and to the planet we return when we die. Ashes to ashes, and stardust to stardust. That's actually what the saying means. Stars form from a type of nuclear fusion, which causes them to undergo nuclear synthesis, which basically is a fancy way of saying they make elements, like periodic table elements, not Genshin elements. Eventually, this star goes supernova, and the explosion hurls out all those tiny elements as particulate matter. In other words, stardust. Being born from the ashes, being created from stardust, honestly, the phoenix is an excellent symbol to represent this, and it's also the perfect symbol to represent the angels of heaven, or rather, the Seelies of Celestia. Now, does that make Guizhong an illuminated beast? 
probably not. I think it's more likely that she is actually a Sealy bearing the imagery of a phoenix due to celestial association with birds. Now, if you're wondering why I keep talking about Sealies as angels, I have a whole video series you may be interested in where I talk about the proof points about why Sealies are angels and why gods are demons and why angels and demons are the same thing. But speaking of stardust, it is said that when Guizhong died, black dust choked the sky. And this is a pretty common way to describe a severe dust storm event like 1935's Black Sunday, the worst dust storm in American history. But I've always wondered where exactly this event took place. Even a weak god like Havria, who died in an explosion of salt, has left a lasting impression on the Liwe landscape. So, if Guizhong was even marginally as powerful as Havria, she should have left a mark too. So where is it? I puzzled about this for a while, and then one of my Discord mods pointed out that there is actually one really suspicious location that fits the criteria. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you went to the Swageway Slopes and looked up? That, my friends, is what I did, and that is a sky full of black dust thick enough to blot out the sun. And that really makes you wonder if Swage Slopes is where this scene takes place. If that's why there are nine pillars of peace decorated with Yaksha masks littered around this place. If that's why there was an empty tomb filled with pointless treasure and an old eroded ring of darkness that you can sell to a couple of merchants in Liyue for some cheap mora. But if Guizhong died here, then the passages on the stone tablets, the description of the Stone of Remembrances, and the Dark Ring, they all kinda start to make sense. Guizhong had no real love of war. She was a pretty peaceful god, all things considered, despite studying mechanical weaponry. So is it not possible that this whole area was turned into a memorial for her after her death during the Archon War? And before she turned to stone, she did apparently tell Zhang Li to forget about trying to solve the puzzle of her stone dumbbell. She said that he should forget about its contents, even though that she had initially stated when she gave it to him that it contained all of her knowledge that would be his if only he could open it. So if she tells him on her deathbed not to open this thing that she had originally wanted him to open, does that not imply that there is something in that dumbbell that could lead to war again? A war that she probably doesn't want. And in thinking about this area as more of a memorial to the goddess of dust that was no longer worshipped by the people of Liwe, kinda got me thinking about something else. <laughs> oh, come on, you knew this video was gonna talk about the uncanny resemblance between Syndrone and Guizhong, didn't you? I mean, how could I possibly ignore something like this? Now, what we do know of Syndrone is oddly in character with what we know of Guizhong, apart from their presumed temperaments, that is. They have near-identical faces, hair color, eye color, they both have a fascination with Conry and machinery. It's a little too coincidental. Now, I know I've made some crazy theories in the past about, like, Minogius being Capitano, and, like, let's be clear, I've never fully subscribed to the idea. I just thought it was really fun and crack, and it doesn't matter how many times I tell people that it's, like, just a crazy fun what-if. People think I'm serious. So, I need to be very clear right now, I am not about to claim that Sandrone is Guizhong, but I also will not deny the resemblance between the two. Now remember, Sandrone's Fatui title is the Marionette, which implies she is a puppet, like Scaramouche, and Scaramouche was a puppet built with Conrian technology, of which Guizhong was particularly interested in, and it seems Sandrone understands fairly well. So what if it's less that Sandrone is Guizhong, as many will claim, and more that Sandrone's current body was crafted in the image of Guizhong? Not unlike how Scaramouche may have been crafted in the image of Makoto. And what if this resemblance, this uncanny set of similarities, has something to do with Zhongli's secret contract with the Tsaritsa that he traded an entire Gnosis for? And to take it one step further, what if the rite of parting that we held in Liwei all the way back in Chapter 1 
was never actually for Rex Lapis, but instead for the Goddess of Dust. Because, like, during the ceremony preparations, not only do we go retrieve Guizhong's bell, which I know was used for other ceremonies and rites of parting, but stick with me, but we also required glaze lilies for the incense and perfume for older women in order to complete the ceremony. Well, guess what? Glaze lilies are Guizhong's flower. We already covered that. And Soraya in the Treasure Lost Treasure Found quest said that Guizhong descended to Tevat before Zhang Li did. That's strong evidence that she could have been older than Zhang Li. So it would have been a perfume for her preference, not Zhang Li's preference. And finally, we needed Noctilucus Jade, a blue jade that glows at night, similar to the Glazelies and in Guizhong's color palette. So uh, why would Zhang Li want Noctilucus Jade to represent him when Core Lapis is the stone that's far more associated with him? In my opinion, this is because the rite of parting was him saying one final proper farewell to Guizhong. Because let's be real, Zhang Li had no intention of hiding from the Adepti. They knew right away that he wasn't dead. The whole faking his death thing was just for the people of Liwe and for no one else's benefit. And given that the people of Liwe weren't even really interested in performing the rite of parting anyway, why would he go through the trouble of performing the rite of parting for himself if the people don't care and his faked death was for their benefit? It, it wasn't for them. The rite of parting was not for the people of Liwe. It was for him and the other Adepti to have a proper send-off, not to Rex Lapis, but to Guizhong. It's also important to consider this event as a potential teaser for an upcoming Archon quest because that's something Hoyoverse likes to do a lot. Remember how Moonchase teased a young Madame Ping and then the Golden Apple Archipelago teased the dream sequences of Sumeru and the Iridori Festival teased the inversion of Genesis quest for Scaramouche? I, I just, don't you think that this year's Lantern Rite could possibly be teasing a future quest in Fontaine potentially due to the Fontaine iridescent tour themes that tie it in with this year's festival and that all of that might feature Syndrone? Because I think there is a distinct possibility that that is in fact the case. But all right, that's enough theorizing. Now I want to share a bunch of fun little things with you, lore bits that you might have missed. If you were ever curious about what type of illuminated beast Madame Ping is, she's a carp. Or at least a type of fish. I'm 99% sure of this. Look, her original outfit has scales on it, and the sleeves and dress have thin markings, which are just like Kokomi's. And Kokomi was supposed to represent this carp that could eventually turn into a dragon for reasons that I should not have to explain to you. And Madame Ping's instrument has what appears to be a fish carving on one end of it. I don't know whether she's something like a Kun Peng, which is like a flying carp, or at least like a winged fish, or if she's supposed to be a carp that's supposed to be more like Kokomi and jump over the dragon's gate and eventually turn into a dragon, but either way, she's a fish. Now, I find it hilarious that Minogius has been a fashion designer this whole time. We always thought he was dressed like Zhang Li because he was like a Zhang Li fanboy kind of thing, but as it turns out, Minogius was just his stylist. I love this tidbit so much. You have no idea. But what I will say is that it gives a whole new meaning to Zhang Li's current outfit. The fact that he's wearing clothes one of his yaksha made for him is not only a lovely way to honor his memory, but it also shows, without a doubt, that he never intended to hide his identity from any of his Adepti companions after he faked his own death. Now, Zhang Lui and Guizhong have some odd similarities to the Travelers. The obvious one is that Guizhong has a similar haircut and dress to Lun Min, but it's also very likely that Guizhong wielded a sword, as the Primordial Jade Cutter was supposedly crafted for her. But the less obvious connection here is that Zhang Li's earring is way too similar to Ether's earring to be a coincidence. I refuse to believe that this similarity was an accident. I don't know how this pair is connected to the twins, but they are connected. I have connected the dots, I've connected them. My biggest annoyance with this whole Lantern Raid Festival came from Xiao, because Xiao is present during Gui Zhang's death, and that provides some kind of problems in terms of the timeline and figuring out when the Archon War happened, because Xiao should be 
just over 2,000 years old because it's stated in no less than three places, including a developer interview. This number has been used many times to help stabilize the timeline a little bit. However, the actual line reads that his true age is something over 2,000 years, and that's kind of it. And like, any number greater than 2,000 is a potential age for him now, which means that he could be like 4,000 years old instead of like 2,700, which was the previous assumption. So there's that, at least. I just kind of hate the use of like an explicit number instead of just saying several thousand years because it's kind of like if someone asked you how big a car was and you responded with it's bigger than a penny. Like, that's not wrong, but it's still a terrible comparison. Anyway, it's actually a good thing if Zhao is older than 3,000 years because it would explain why he has more of a senior-style relationship with Ganyu. Because previously it was thought that she was older than him, but she was treating him as her senior, so it was kind of a little bit odd. So anyway, his appearance here in Guizhong's death scene actually does make sense. It just means that he was rescued very early on into the Archon War. And I think that's all I had to share. This year's Lantern Rite was excellent in a lot of ways, but I kind of wish that Venti hadn't been tagged on as like kind of an afterthought. The same with Hu Tao. On the one hand, I get it. They wanted to talk about the Whaley Assembly again, but like on the other hand, I wish Venti and Hu Tao had been more involved or just had their own side story, you know? But that just about does it for me today. I just want to thank you guys all so much for watching and another special thank you to members for helping to make these videos possible. And a shout out to the, all the people who helped me kind of piece together all these little bits because uh, I didn't do them all myself this time. Lots of people contributed. Everyone was very excited. So thank you all for helping with that. I really, really appreciate it. All right, I'm gonna go. Take care, guys. I will catch you in the next one. Later!